Amen. Well, now we come to the sad part of David's life. There are two verses I want to emphasize to you. The first is in 1 Kings 15:15, 15, 15, and this is what it says. It says that David served the Lord except in the matter of the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So what God said is in 1 Kings 15:5 that when he looked at David's life, the thing that David did was right in his sight except for that one thing. You know what that means? That when you have all the normal struggles in life, when you have all the normal problems, David was afraid, David was impatient, David you know, had all of these normal little things we all go through, God says, that's, I understand. But David and Bathsheba was not normal. And what we're going to see now is what 1 Peter 5.8, does anybody know what 1 Peter 5.8 says? That's a good verse to have memorized. Yep, you guys have memorized it. Good. Good. Boy knows it. It's what you see on the picture. Every day, there's a lion that's pursuing Rodelio. There's a lion that's following Camille and Richard. And that lion is looking to see whether or not you drop your guard. Uh, when I was a, a little boy, my mother raised chickens. She liked fresh eggs. And there were these roosters that had those big side claws. Have you ever seen how roosters fight? Uh, you know, they, they kick up those side and they scratch you. You can, you can be bleeding from that. So when I was a little boy, I always carried a stick like an umbrella. And I carried that stick when I had to walk around the chickens. And when that rooster would come up, I would put my stick in front of me. And if he put up his claws, he would only get the stick. He couldn't get to me. And what I learned is, whenever the rooster saw me walking with my stick, he didn't bother me. But when I forgot my stick, he would come up and start trying to get me with his claws and bother me. And that's called being on guard. Now, I didn't, hit, I didn't hit the rooster. I wasn't mean to the chickens. But I always kept my guard out there, my stick, because I knew that they were after me. What God says is, our adversary, the devil, and David, our 13th hour, the theme is unguarded when David was defeated. And that's 2 Samuel 11. So let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And this is the, the darkest moment of David's life. And it begins the rest of his life. The rest of his life from 2 Samuel 11 on is colored by this event. Everything that happens is recorded. Now, do you remember what I told you? David is the most written about person. If you count up all the verses in all the chapters, the 141 chapters that are about David, there are 141 chapters out of 1,189 in the Bible. So there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. 140 uh, one of them talk about David. If you add up all the verses, 10%, 10% of the Bible is about David. 10%, that's huge. 10% of all the verses in the Bible have something to do with David. Now let's, let's talk about his life. David, when he was at the top, was a victorious warrior. He never lost a battle. He was a clever general. Now look what he does. Up through chapter 10, he subdues the Philistines to the west, the Syrians and Hadadezer to the north, the Ammonites and Moabs to the east, and the Edomites and the Amalekites to the south. In other words, north, south, uh, east, and west. He has completely decimated and subdued everybody. 
he, he was the most victorious general. Never lost a battle, never was wounded, always led his men, except for once. You see, this is the time David's not leading his men. Look what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it happened in the spring of the year, verse 1, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Here's the first principle. Temptations usually strike when you're all alone. Think about that. Temptations usually strike. Not when you're with all your friends. Not when they're saying, hey, how are you doing? Are you going out on open air evangelism? Are you, how are you doing reading your Bible? Temptations usually strike when we're all alone. And if you look at people that have fallen into sin, it's when they're away from their family, away from their wife, away from their parents, when they're off at school, off at the Bible Institute, or traveling somewhere, that they're all alone and they're tempted. And, and notice verse 1. The whole event starts with David not doing what he's supposed to do. David was supposed to lead the army. David was supposed to be there with his men, his soldiers. David was the one that was supposed to be on site as they battled the Ammonites. But David sent every man between the age of 20 and 50 to the war, and he stayed back. That's not wise. Who were the only ones that were home? The women, the wives, and the old people, and David. See, the whole thing was not good. Uh, David was very successful, secondly, as an administrator. Uh, other than this one event of what we see that we're going to look at, David did so many good things. He, he judged and provided justice. For the he organizes the priesthood into the, the 24 courses we see in the New Testament. What David started lasted a thousand years. And all of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth and John the Baptist's parents, it says in Luke that Zechariah came according to the, the, the 24 courses of priests that David established. So David was amazing. Plus, he was unmatched as a poet and songwriter. The best-selling book in history is the Bible, and David the most songs that all of us know from the Bible of anybody. So he is unmatched as a poet, as a songwriter in the Psalms. But what David didn't do is beware of the prowling lion. He didn't keep the stick, the guard, because... There's never a time in our life where the devil backs off. He's always a prowling lion, and it doesn't matter if you're young, middle-aged, or old, he's still wanting to devour you. Now, do you notice what 1 Peter 5, 8 says? It says Satan is looking to devour a believer. Devour, he can't destroy us, he can't indwell us, he can't take away our salvation, but he can get us not to obey the Lord. That's what devoured is, not doing what we were called to do. So beware of the prowling lion. Now this is the turning point of David's life. Uh, David's turning point, his great sin, is clearly written down in the Bible. See, that's one of the things about the Bible we know what David was thinking, we know what he was feeling, what he was saying, we know what he was doing, we know what was going on around, we know what no one else knew except God. And it's all written down for us. But it culminates with a process. Do you remember what it said uh, on that chart? I said that David had how many concubines? Ten. How many wives? Eight. What did Deuteronomy say? Deuteronomy 17:17. 17, 17. It says, don't multiply wives. You see, David's sin with Bathsheba, you notice the sin with Bathsheba is in 2 Samuel 11. But really, the sin 
starts in 2 Samuel 5. Before Bathsheba, David started cutting the corners. Before Bathsheba, David didn't completely obey what he had written down. Remember, he wrote his own copy. He knew God's expectations. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't multiply horses. Don't multiply gold. Don't multiply wives. Don't get distracted. Don't get drawn back. But he did. Now what the blessing is, in Psalm 51, he said, I, I am guilty. I was wrong. I sinned. Now what's interesting is when Saul sinned, do you remember what he said? The people made me do it. When King Saul didn't kill Agag, Samuel approached him and Samuel says, what's going on? Why didn't you kill Agag? And Saul goes, it's not my fault. The people, the people made me do it. The people caused all this. The people spared the best. Now just think, if the electricity goes off, we get to go to the break early. Right? Isn't that exciting? So stop praying it goes off. I want to finish, okay? Pray that it stays on. Uh, but the difference is when Saul sinned, he blamed it on everybody else. When David sinned, he blamed it on himself. He said, I'm guilty. I sinned. I was wrong. Okay. What does sin do? Now Galatians, the book of Galatians, chapter 6, Verses uh, 7 and 8 say, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he reap. He that sows to the flesh, will from the flesh reap corruption. What did, David, what did David experience? Well, remorse and contrition did not obliterate the consequences. What happens in David's life? We have incest. We have a brother having sexual relations with his sister. That is a great sin. It's called incest. Sexual relations between relatives, God said, is sin. Abomination. Don't do it. We have fratricide. What is fratricide? The second word. A brother killing a brother. Frater is the word for brother and it's brothers killing brothers. We have intrigues, all these rebellions and civil war. David wasn't even allowed to build the temple. A lot. So what I'm saying is, even though we are forgiven for sins, God says there's still consequences. Now, when I grew up, my parents worked at the local rescue mission. In America, downtown, in every city, they have a little mission called a rescue mission and they work with the alcoholics, the homeless, the street people, the drug addicts, the people that are really struggling in life and it's a rescue mission. So they're downtown and they provide housing, food, share the gospel, try and win these people that are living on the street and alcoholics, drunk, sick, try and win them to the Lord. My parents when I was growing up, would bring home men that got saved at the mission. Those who came to know the Lord at the rescue mission, when they got saved, they would bring them from the mission to our house because they wanted them away from the bars, away from the, all that goes on at night in the city. And those men would sit at the table. I grew up sitting at the meals with former drug addicts, former alcoholics, people that have been in jail. And they do you know where they slept? My parents would let them sleep in my bed. And I slept on the floor. I grew up sleeping on the floor next to some guy from the rescue mission that my parents were helping out. And, but what I learned is this. Even though their sins were forgiven, even though they were going to heaven, God did not give them a new stomach had had consumed so much alcohol that they had ulcers in their stomach that's holes where you've eaten a hole through the lining of your stomach and your stomach bleeds and you're sick all the time 
And also their liver, the liver of your body filters out poison. And when, when your liver works, all the different poisons go into the liver and they're encased and they're gotten rid of so you don't get sick. But when you drink too much alcohol, it overwhelms your liver and it stops working. Do you know what? God gave all those men that got saved a new heart, but he didn't give them a new liver or a new stomach. What is that? Consequences. There are consequences to sin. Now, let me ask you, is Galatians in the Old or the New Testament? The New Testament. Do you know what a lot of people think? David suffered consequences for his sin, but I'm under grace. I'm in the New Testament. Wait a minute. The grace of God that brings us salvation warns us if you don't depart from sin, there will be consequences. There are consequences for New Testament believers who live in sin. And that's what we're going to see with David. Um, what happened? Well, the Lord told him in 2 Samuel 12 10, that the sword would never depart from his family. His first son by Bathsheba died, the son that was illegitimate. The son David committed adultery and conceived with Uriah's wife Bathsheba. That baby died. That was the first casualty of David's sin. Second, Ammon, David's oldest son, raped David's daughter Tamar. So Ammon raped his own sister. That was another consequence of David's sin. Absalom kills Ammon. Absalom, another son of David, kills Ammon, the oldest son of David. Ammon was the one in line to become the king. Absalom kills him and tries to become the king himself. Rebellion against David and his counsel by, do you see that word right there, Ahithophel? Who was Ahithophel? Ahithophel was David's counselor. Ahithophel lived right next door to David. Ahithophel had a granddaughter, and her name was Bathsheba. David's counselor, his closest advisor, a man who people said when he talked he was like God, he was so smart, had a beautiful granddaughter, a young teenage girl, that David had watched grow up. And one of David's mighty men named Uriah, one of David's closest, greatest soldiers, had married the granddaughter of David's counselor, Ahithophel, and that granddaughter's name was Bathsheba. So David had known Bathsheba since she was born. David had, had been there for her, her coming into the world and seen all of her birthday parties and had watched this young lady grow up. And that's what happened. David was up on his rooftop watching this young teenage girl taking a bath. And David was up on his rooftop and this whole event. And that's why Ahithophel joined Absalom. And then finally Adonijah tried to take the throne. Okay, three lessons that we need to learn. Number one, unbound moments lead to sin. First, uh, Uriah and Bathsheba, that, that whole event of David committing adultery and killing Uriah, is the saddest chapter, the darkest, and the ones we all wince at. David's sin with Bathsheba. The lesson is unguarded moments. If you don't keep the stick up to the rooster, he'll, he'll get you. If you don't keep your guard up against the devil, if you ever think, oh, I'm beyond that sin, that's when he gets us. Unguarded moments. Number two, inevitable consequences lead to pain. Do you remember this? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. God is watching. Whatever we are going to reap, even as believers. Inevitable consequences lead to pain. Absalom, Shimei, these are chapters that record the many years of painful consequences.
from 2 Samuel 12, 21 to 24 on. The whole rest of David's life is marked to his last days by the consequences of the sin of, of Bathsheba, adultery. And finally, the lesson we're going to learn is humble obedience leads to joy. David had Solomon, his beloved son, take the throne. David wrote psalms. David invested all of his money in the temple. And those last final days of David's life, despite failures with Bathsheba, David was truly a man after God's own heart. Okay, how did David descend into sin? I call this six dreadful steps downward. And what we'll see is, it started back there in 2 Samuel 5.13. It started with a little disobedience. A little, a little breaking the rules. A little saying, I'm above everybody else's rules. And here they are. Number one, David was desensitized in his conscience by incomplete obedience. Then he relaxed his grip on personal purity. Then he fixated his heart on his physical desires. We're going to go through these one at a time. Then he rationalized in his mind and said, it's okay for me, I'm the king. He plunged his life into lustful sin. And the bottom line is he destroyed his testimony. But let's look at them one at a time. In 2 Samuel 5, look what it says in verse 13. So in your Bible, turn back to verse 13. And if you haven't marked this yet, underline or note, it says, And David took more concubines and wives after he had come from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born. Now that looks completely innocent, except God said, don't do that. When you become king, like everybody else, nobody else, nobody else could afford to have a lot of wives. You had to go out in the field and work. You had to build a house for them. You had to take care of the kids and feed them. You had to guard them. You had to have room for them. Normal people couldn't have multiple wives. Normal people had one wife and a family. But when you were a king, when you were wealthy, you had the money and the, the resources to do what others couldn't do. And God said, don't do that as a king. But David did. So David desensitized his conscience. Now let me tell you a real quick story. I had a friend in college who lived in America, uh, in Texas. That's down, it's the biggest, second biggest state in America. They grow cattle there. They have big cattle. They're called longhorns. Their horns stick way out wider than the cow. And I went to visit my friend, and their, their ranch was so big, we had to ride a Jeep around to see all their ranch. And his mother was a Texas woman that wore a big hat. In America, they have these hat holders there are these kind of pins that go into a woman's hair, their hat from blowing off. And this woman, the mother of my friend, was driving the Jeep, and she took me up to one of these cows, and these cows were as high as my shoulder. This is where the, the cows, the end of the cow, its back was this high. So these are large cows. They weren't cows, they were cows. Every one of them, the cows on the side of them had a brand. In, in America, each ranch, they have a round circle, and then they have, you know, the T R ranch. And so they make like a symbol like this, put it on a piece of metal, and have a handle out of it, and then this, this brand, they put into a fire, it gets real hot, they tie up the cow, and they mark the cow by burning that symbol in the side of the cow. So that when the cow wanders off with someone else's cows, you can go, oh, that one has my symbol, my brand, my mark on the side of it. And so it's common all the cows had these marks during the early ranching days. So I was riding along, and... The mother said, I want to teach you something you'll never forget the rest of your life. I said, what is it? She said, you're going to be a preacher, right? I said, yep. She said, I want to show you what happens when something gets desensitized. 
That's a big English word. I'll never forget what it means. She parked the Jeep. She reached up in her hat and pulled out one of those hat pins. A hat pin is about this long and really sharp. It's a pin. It's like a needle. And it was holding her hat in, but when she pulled it out, it was that long. And she went up to one of those cows that's this tall, its back. Its head was up here. I mean, this is a monster cow. And she takes her pin, she said, watch. And right here on the side of the cow was that brand. And what happens when you put the brand in the fire and it gets red hot, and then you burn the cow, right where that burn is on the side of the cow, here's the cow, and there's its tail. How do you like my drawing? Here's the brand right here, this bar double R. She walked up like this, and the cow was chewing like this. And she takes her hat pin and goes and sticks it that far into the cow. Sticks it right into the cow, and it's sticking out like that. You know what the cow did? It didn't move. Why? It didn't feel it. It couldn't feel any feeling where it had been branded by that mark. Because branding desensitizes us from feeling things. It killed the nerves. Do you know what David did? David stopped feeling conviction about sin because his conscience was desensitized by incomplete obedience. That's number one. Number two, look at chapter 11. All the other kings, I, all the other soldiers go to battle, it said. We already read this verse. David doesn't go to battle. David stays back. And David, it says, look at chapter 11. Uh, David remained in Jerusalem. David purity. David his grip on personal purity. Everybody else is gone, so David stays back, and look what he does in verse 2. Then it happened. Now, you know what we call that? When we say something just happened, David no longer scheduled his time. Now think about it. You're at Word of Life, and you, are, you have... Uh, you're supposed to get up in the morning, you're supposed to have your devotions, you're supposed to go to breakfast, you're supposed to get ready, you're supposed to go to class, you're supposed to go and uh, go to all your classes and then study, and then you're supposed to do your homework, and you've got all these projects, so you have this schedule. And, uh, you know, get up, devotions, uh, class, do your work, your jobs, do your studies, uh, go to prayer meeting and chapel and rehearsals, and then get to bed. And you've got this schedule, and you're in school, you're at Word of Life. But guess what happens? You go home for the holidays, and you don't have a schedule. And you relax your grip, remember, on your disciplines. And so what happens is, David started fixating on his physical desires. Look what it says in verse 2. He's relaxed his grip, he doesn't, he's alone, he's unscheduled, and it says, One evening David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and he's walking, remember the king's house is taller than everybody's house, and he's walking around the edge doing this. And he's looking down. And all of a sudden he stops. And look what happens. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. Now, there's one thing. If you're walking along and you see someone, you know, and 
you see that they're doing something you shouldn't look at, you know, or they, they're not fully clothed, there's nothing wrong noticing that, but you go like this and you keep going. I had one of my sons, uh, I have five sons, I'll never forget one of them. Uh, m their mother, Bonnie, had our daughters and she was inside of a shopping uh, outlets you know, here, I think, outlets, you know, all these little stores. And I was in charge of walking with my two youngest sons while mom and the girls were shopping. We were just walking and I was talking to them and holding their hands like this. And all of a sudden, my one son, my youngest son, my littlest son, started dragging his feet and he wouldn't look up and it was kind of like I was pulling him and he had his arm like this over his head and so I'm pulling him he's got his he's holding my hand but he's 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 kind of like acting really strange and I tugged him a little bit and I said what are you doing and he went like this and then he went And I, so I looked up, we were in front of a women's underwear store called Victoria's Secret. And there was a 30 foot high woman in her underwear on the wall. It was an advertisement. And he was going like this. I was walking back and forth in front of that store with them, talking to him. I didn't even notice it there. And he's going like this. Why? Because I told him it's wrong to look at, at unclothed women. I said, for the rest of your life, until you get there's only one woman you're supposed to look at without their clothes on, that's your wife. No one else. And until you know which one's your wife, don't look at any of them. Hmm. He's going through me dragging him in front of this 30-foot high underwear girl. David didn't go like that. David came up. He noticed Bathsheba and the verse says she was beautiful to behold. The Hebrew word means he fixated. He totally focused. That's all he would do is look at her. So it doesn't stop there. Um, he, she was beautiful to behold. So look at this. The next verse, verse 3. So David sent and inquired about the woman and said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, who happened to be the son of Ahithophel? And David knew that, his counselor. That's why, that's why you could see her. His counselor lived right next door to him. And so his whole family lived there. So Ahithophel lived in that house, and Eliam lived in that house, and Bathsheba lived in that house, because in the ancient world, what you did is, the parents had a house, and their first son would build on to the house, and then what would happen is when, so here's the, the dad, then the son, and then what would happen is, when the dad got older and became the grandpa, he moved into the littler house, the son moved there, and their grand, his grandson, their son, built onto the house. So most houses in the Bible times had three little parts. The main house, uh, the first little extra, and the second little extra. So basically, um, Ahithophel lived here, Bathsheba lived here, and Eliam lived here. And David house was way up here and David was up there looking down into her courtyard which he shouldn't have done but but watch what happens in in uh, chapter 11 and David sent and inquired about the woman and someone said so David sends his servants and they run down from the castle to this house Someone taking a bath down here? You shouldn't have been taking a bath. The king's up there watching you. Who is it? And find out. Look what it says in verse 3. It's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. What does the end of verse 3 say? 
the wife she's married. Now, did David have a whole bunch of concubines? Yes, ten. Did he have a whole bunch of wives? Yes, eight. Could David, is he powerful and rich enough to have as many women as he wanted in the world? Yes. And no one would have said there's anything wrong with it. They would have just expected it. Everyone knew it was wrong to take someone else's wife. Everyone. Everyone. What did David do? He rationalized in his mind about his wrong decision. He watched her long enough that he decided he wanted her no matter what. He sends down messengers. The messengers say, what the messengers do is this. They go, whoa, Mr. King, that is your counselor's granddaughter. This is your most trusted soldier, Uriah. Uriah was David's bodyguard. Uriah was a man that would die to save David's life. That's what a bodyguard is. Our president has these men that, that have guns that are called Secret Service. And when anybody tries to kill the American president, the Secret Service men throw their body between the, the uh, attacker and the president and take the bullet. That actually has happened several times in history, where an American bodyguard saved the president's life by being shot instead of the president. That's what David had. David had a loyal Uriah who lived right at the foot of his... Do you know why Uriah and Ahithophel were there? To protect David. And David is looking at Uriah's wife. Wow. And look what happens. They said, is this not, verse 3, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? That was David's messengers trying to stop him. They put up a roadblock. They said, you shouldn't do this, David. And look what he does in verse 4. David sent messengers and took her. You know what that means? He pushed him aside. He said, I don't care if she's married. I don't care if she's my counselor's granddaughter. I don't care if she's my bodyguard's wife. I want her. And I want her now. That's, that's what went on in his mind. Do you know what the Bible says? 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Everybody look at 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Do you all know this? The warning from God, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. This is a verse that all of us should mark and memorize. It's something we should all think about every day. Verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Don't ever think you're above sin. Don't ever think that you're beyond sin. Don't ever think, I would never do that. David is a man after God's own heart. David knew the Lord face to face. David knew the voice of the Lord. David wrote all those psalms. David knew God's power, knew God's presence, and David did it. Beware of the consequence of sin. If you think that you can, you know, some people say, oh, I can take it. I can go back to my old girlfriend and I won't fall back into sin. I can go back to the area I used to drink alcohol in. I can go back to where I used to get drugs. I can go back to where I used to be involved in all the sin. I've, I'm, you know, I'm strong now. What does verse 12 say? Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Well, the lesson is in 2 Timothy 2.22. Turn to the right. You're in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Timothy. Look at 2nd Timothy 2.22. This is what Dave, or this is what Paul told Timothy, his son in the faith, Timothy, a pastor, Timothy, a servant of the Lord. This is the lesson we all have to learn. 2nd Timothy 2.22. Unguarded moments lead to sin unless we do what? Now see, David came up to the edge of his house. As soon as he looked down and saw Bathsheba, what should he have done? What does verse 22 say? Someone read it. Let's see. Uh, uh, I think it's David is next. Did you read after me? So David, 2 Timothy 2.22. Can you read that to us? Love and peace, along with those who 
And the first word, the imperative is flee. Did you know we can't keep ourselves from walking down and seeing posters like my son saw of the girl in her underwear? Okay? You'll see bad things all the way through life. David saw the bad thing and didn't flee. He didn't do this. He didn't say no. He didn't say, I will not set anything wicked before my eyes. He stood and looked at it and said, I want it. I want it. Unguarded moments lead to sin. Now, do you know what 1 Corinthians, I had you read verse 12. Let me read to you verse 13 of chapter 2. Because it says, no temptation has overtaken you. Have any of you ever seen Jurassic Park, the movie? Joseph has. You have? Do you know the dinosaur movie? And the Jeep is right here. And they're driving in the Jeep. And the dinosaur is running like this. And it's opening its mouth. And it's coming right up on the Jeep. And you can see, it's such a good moment in Steven Spielberg's filmmaking. In the mirror you see the mouth of the dinosaur coming toward them, okay? The dinosaur was overtaking the Jeep. Now look at 1 Corinthians 10. There hath no temptation overtaken you. That means temptation is a dinosaur chasing us every day. Do you know one thing about dinosaurs? They get bigger every year. Did you know that? Did you know reptiles get bigger? Lizards get bigger. That's how you know how old they are. Crocodiles, alligators, snakes. They, they're, they start out this big or this big. And the older they get, the bigger they get. Temptations are like lizards. They're like dinosaurs. They get bigger every year. And they get bigger. And they're always chasing us. But look what it says in verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except which is as common to man, but God is faithful. In unguarded moments, guess who's always there? God. God was standing right next to David saying, you shouldn't do that, David. You shouldn't do that, David. Stop looking at Bathsheba, David. That's Uriah's wife, David. That's Ahithophel's granddaughter, David. Don't look at her, David. Don't, don't send your servants to her. Stop that, David. What we all experience, don't you? It's called conviction. God is saying, don't say that. Don't think that. Don't do that. You shouldn't act that way. That's wrong. And that's what the Holy Spirit, God is always there. Now, before we um, go, I want to read to you something that I have taped in the back of my Bible. I've, I've had this in my Bible since... Um, In the, over the maps, I tape it. This is what it says. It's my personalized list of anticipated consequences of immorality. David should have had this in his Bible. Toward God, immorality would grieve the Lord and displease the one who matters most. Immorality would drag Christ's sacred reputation through the mud. Immorality would cause me to lose my reward and commendation from God. It would make me dread the day I would have to look Jesus in the face at the judgment seat and answer for what I did. It would force God to chasten my life. It would prompt the laughter. Do you know what it says in 1 Samuel 12, or 2 Samuel 12? Nathan looked at David when he confronted him with his sin. And he said, your sin caused God's enemies to rejoice. Do you know what that means? The demons, did you realize that around the throne of God, God is on his throne here in heaven. God allows from time to time, with all this glory, he allows the demons and Satan to actually come and stand in front of his throne. Still, they do that. In the book of Job, it says they regularly come. And what they do is, the demons come and say, hey God, uh, isn't, Joseph, one of yours, look what he's doing. Isn't Pauline one of your uh, children? Look, look. 
Do you see what gold is doing right now, Ronell? See, the devil accuses us to God, seated on his throne. And here, in God's glory is shining, and the, the devil points at us. And when Satan points at us, if I'm Satan, and here's God the Father, and if I'm pointing at Joseph, who comes between Joseph and Satan and stands like this? Jesus Christ. And says, Joseph belongs to me, Father. Satan, I bought this one. That's what it means that he is our advocate. As it says in the book of Hebrews. As it says in 1 John 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the atoning sacrifice. He is our advocate. He is the one who represents us to the Father as the one who protects us. And it would bring laughter and rejoicing and blasphemous smugness from those who disrespect God. 2 Samuel 12, 14. Let me read it to you. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14. This is what it says in chapter 12, verse 14. Nathan said, However, because of this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. What was going on is, the demons and Satan and all of God's enemies were clapping and saying, Hey, isn't that the man after your own heart, God? Isn't that your God? Look what he's doing. He's committing adultery. He's murdering Uriah. He's dying and carrying on. What, what is the lesson? 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's what Satan is doing today. Now let me ask you, how do you protect yourself from the devil? What's the stick we're supposed to carry? What does it say in Ephesians 6? The sword of the Spirit is what? Have you ever learned what the sword of the Spirit is? What is it? The Word of God. Did you know the verses you're memorizing? How many of you have to memorize verses for Word of Life? All of you, don't you? Don't you have to learn? You have verse tests, don't you? Yes? Did you know those are not just to learn and be done with? They're the stick. It's how you say no to the devil. When, when Satan tempts us, we take the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit and we say no. I will not respond. I will not disobey God. I will not. See, what it means is that we go through life knowing that there's always a pack of lions following us. And the only weapon we have against our adversary, the devil, is the sword of the Spirit. And it's when we say no to sin by saying yes to God's Word. I memorize verses about the things that I struggle with so that when Satan tempts me, I can stick my stick out like I did to that rooster when I was little. That's what we're all supposed to be doing. Amen?